We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audiobook presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audiobook with friends and loved ones. The Art of Selfishness by David Seabury. 6. Which Way Happiness? Dr. Sasis left his laboratory with a glow of satisfaction on his face. His research in biochemistry was progressing. It seemed as if he would soon contribute another curative agent for the control of disease. He looked about him as he strode along in the brisk autumn air. Life was good, he mused, as he watched a ferry moving across the Hudson. What a future lay ahead for humanity. He saw men overcoming difficulty after difficulty by means of more and more knowledge of life. An almost holy reverence for the spirit of science possessed him. An hour later, Zis entered his home. Cries greeted his ears. He heard his brother, speaking in firm admonishment. Then came the querulous voice of his aunt Eliza. One of the children must have. Dr. Sasis got no further, his wife appeared in the hall, her eyes ablaze. They glared at him accusingly. Sasis pulled himself together. His dreams departed for some sanctum where he kept them stored. He hadn't done anything, but he knew from long experience he was somehow responsible for the scene upstairs. What's wrong, he asked, feeling his way. Carl has decided to marry that caraway girl. Mrs. Sasis' voice was harsh. Well, why shouldn't he? The father asked mildly, he loves her. And he's going to take that position in South America. Well, why shouldn't he? The doctor repeated. He's fitted for it. He's letting the caraways pay for his team affair. Well, why shouldn't they? They can well afford it. John Henry, you make me furious. She's older than he is, she's a divorcee. Carl is obligated to his uncle now that he's in his business, and as for accepting charity, I can't understand you. You've made your boy selfish, conceited upstart, with your scientific ideas. So it seems, muttered John Sasis mildly and hurried to his study. What was there he could have said to his wife to change the situation? She was not trying to live life on an orderly basis, or to solve her family's difficulties. Millions don't want to correct their troubles. They wish to have their own way. They do not see that the laws of life must be obeyed and increasingly discovered, in exactly the spirit in which modern science strives to know them. In other words, the principles of order that engineers follow must be seen and fulfilled in your personal life as they are accepted by an Edison, or followed by a composer, a skillful designer, a true artist. Life, thus lived, is a creative experience. It permits no successful deviation from basic law. You cannot be ugly in your handling of events without being repaid in kind at the end. There are, I suppose, four sorts of men on earth ruthless egotists, who take the way of greed, virtuous conventionalists, who follow the creeds, the blind rebels, who will not yield to any rules, and the men of science, who strive to obey natural law. There is no meeting point between the old and the new attitudes in the face of life's problems. We go to roads. Those who revere the good old ways follow the precepts and the conventions. Those who seek to obey nature, through the discoveries of science, follow another set of values. If you ask a follower of shibboleths how to overcome troubles, his answer is consistent with his moral biases. Should you consult a devotee of science, he gives conclusions built on his insight. The solutions of latter seem selfish to the former. The compromisers see nothing evil in defiling personality just as savages thought it right to distort their bodies. To those who believe such deformities are wrong, no compromise is a basic tenet of integrity. To become a sickly halfway man seems inexcusable. Faced with this division, the question of living life is not one of wisdom only, but of daring. You may have intelligence enough to see a practical solution. Have you the nerve to follow it? If not, you might as well be stupid. There is no right and wrong for you, therefore, 
in the handling of your problems until you decide what you buy right, either adherence to the stereotype, or obedience to cosmic law. The first step we must take in any discussion of overcoming life's difficulties is so to clarify the consequences of the various procedures possible that we come to a definite decision as to where we stand. There is power in conviction. If you believe you have the forces of truth on your side, you have the strength of ten. If you doubt your decisions, the greatest wisdom is forceless. This is a point consistently ignored by books on the art of living. They characteristically give you convenient little recipes for happiness, which cause you pain when followed, unless your heart is friendly with your head. You cannot imagine Mrs. Sace as following the best methods for meeting her parental and marital crises. If that wisdom was against her biases. It is for this reason that advice is never practical unless it arouses faith. Belief is essential. Without it, the battle is transferred from circumstance to a man's breast. His soul is torn between two wills, neither of which he can follow with confidence. If I had only a few central points to offer for overcoming our daily quandaries, the first would be, don't follow any advice, no matter how good, until you feel as deeply in your spirit as you think in your mind that the counsel is wise. And the second caution would be like the first, don't assume that the established ways of thinking about human conduct are true and perfect just because they are established. They are quite as likely to be as insane as the customs you repudiate. 7. The Better Laziness As the taxi sped him from the station, Elwood Winters smiled ruefully. He would soon be at the scene where he had spent years of effort back at the task to which he had given his youth. He found the new manager, Farnsworth, sitting comfortably in his office smoking meditatively. He had lots of time to himself, he explained, lots of time at a task that had driven winters from morning to night. How do you do it? Elwood asked. I never do anything I can get someone to do for me and I don't touch a task myself if I can get method or some instrument to do the work. We're living in a mechanical age. We don't paddle across the ocean, or dig ditches with our hands. We use two. I make mental tools do my work. What sort of instruments and methods manage this company? Winters demanded incredulously, thinking of the strikes and sabotage that had caused his collapse. Three of them, Farnsworth smiled. One method, two instruments. First, I found it was necessary to get more morale into the men. I formed a promotion committee and left the question of advancement in their hands. Then I imported the council method we'd had at school. You went there, too. Wasn't there a student council in charge of all discipline? Why, yes, certainly. Well, I've employed exactly the same method here, and it works. They are more severe to than I'd be, but the men take it from each other. Thirdly, I've an experimental department for business advancement. It concerns every branch of our work. Each employee spends one day a month there. He has a chance to see the whole problem of the business as it relates to his work. He's offered a bonus for every suggestion he can make. He's paid for any invention he originates and compensated for formulas, sales and advertising hints as well. The men like the creative spirit this research offers and rise eagerly to the competitive opportunity. We've improved sales and gotten no end of good ideas. But the best of it is, the men see what our manufacturing and selling job is. I merely direct things now. They manage themselves. In fact, I've decided to keep away from the plant more than I did at first. A fresh perspective is quite as important as a lot of effort. And after all, there's always a method. Say, do you remember me back at school? Winters nodded. He had not thought it wise to bring the matter up, for Farnsworth had been a problem to the very student council he now so admired. I get the cause of your reticence. Farnsworth grinned. I sure was a case in those days. I wonder if you recall Sudbury, our English teacher. 
He was my counsel for defense in a court martial once, and the way he saved me from dismissal has always stuck in my mind. I'd done all the things I was accused of, and hadn't a chance to win in that hard boiled court. It was one of those grand spring days we get down south sometimes, and I looked around the campus at the other cadets, wondering what father would do to me when I'm home. Sudbury seemed calm enough, however, about my case, and spoke confidently of my continuance at school. There's always a way to win, my boy, he smiled and I want you here. There are some things I need to teach you. I stayed too. His method was as simple as the hills. He surprised the court by making no defense at all. I was the only witness. He put me on the stand and made me admit every charge against me. My case didn't involve anyone else and I told it all. Then Sudbury rose, gentlemen of the court, you have had a superb example of frankness, integrity and good sportsmanship, he said in his gentlest tones. The defendant proves by his sincerity that he is a clean, honest American boy, caught in the natural mischief we expect to deal with in every school. Academy publicly announces that it can take any boy of character and make a man of him. If it is the wheelie of the court that he be dismissed, we would certainly owe an apology to his parents and a withdrawal of our own word to the American public. They couldn't drop me after that, of course. Sudbury had merely taken the school's boast on its face value and used it word for word in my defense. They couldn't have sent a report of that court martial to my honor bet. He's a lawyer, you know, and he'd have Sudbury's logic on the instant. I learned a lot at the academy after that, but the most important thing of all was the fact that there's always a method or an instrument that will work for you and save you trouble. On his way back to the station, Winters thought of the recent months at the sanitarium and what they had cost. He counted up the salary he would have received. And all because he had tried too hard. Some might think that faithful effort didn't pay. And it didn't as he had done it. But that wasn't the real truth of the matter. He knew that now. It was how he had worked that had failed, loyal toil could be expended endlessly and never be appreciated lf he didn't do it the right way. Well, he learned a lesson. He'd handle his new job very differently, thanks to Farnsworth. A journey across a continent was once arduous. Nobody made it so. Man, through science, has conquered this dilemma of distance. Making a yard of cotton cloth used to be an endless task. It has been turned by man into a simple matter through the invention of automatic machinery. Success in handling problems consists in gaining the attitude of mechanics and of learning how to harness one's selfishness in relation to social requirements so that the dilemmas of life are constantly overcome. It is the purpose of effort to discover the better way. To lift a mighty rock from a field of loam would strain a giant's back. To pry it loose with a crowbar is not difficult. To make a hole deep in the earth that water or oil might be extracted from beneath the soil once took years. We bore it now with a drill, swiftly and with ease. Every act of conquest in nature has been achieved by the use of methods and instruments. In the objective realm we take this fact as a matter of course. In personal problems and subjective anxieties, we neglect to follow the same principle. We not only fail to look for such keys, but we contest the idea that they are available. Just as our forefathers opposed each mechanical advance, deriding those who supposed the hard facts of life could ever be conquered, so we refuse to believe that the control of circumstance lies largely in our attitude toward it. It matters little whether yours are the dilemmas of love and mine money anxieties, or the problems of food, clothing and shelter. The question of how we deal with them is all important. It is we, with all our personal uncertainties, who are caught in the mystery of experience, we who seek understanding and an opportunity to overcome the odds against us. While we pray for money to pay the bills, there should be supplications for insight to stimulate our wealth producing abilities. Money is made by men whose minds are free of muddle headedness. Power and plenty, 
position and even pleasure do not come with any permanence as long as constrictions of consciousness create mental compromise. He who has not means and seeks them, she whose independence and ease are conspicuous by their absence, need to put their lives in order that their wits may work on the winning of affluence. No frenzied focus on objective tasks will force life to give us good fortune if we continually circumvent favorable events by mental obliqueness. It is part of life to overcome, and again to overcome, whatever hinders us. Fortune changes when we change. He who puts himself in order affects his relation to life in vital ways. He brings to events a new face. Until he does this, fate so seems to destroy his efforts that he easily rationalizes himself as its victim. This is why the doctrine of never compromise yourself is so essential to intelligent living. When you are wedged in, your power is also limited and you have a less dynamic instrument with which to overcome your problems. How do you do in trouble? The question of where you put your attention when confronted with a difficulty determines how well the problem is solved and whether or not you become the victim of the circumstance. How do you do? When overworked, do you fuss about it, or try to reduce the strain? If bothered by inconvenience, do you stop to see how a better way can be found, or do you irritably endure the handicaps? When oppressed by your job, do you plan ways to work through it, and out of it, to a better situation, or do you fill your heart with anger? To know where you are putting your attention is far more important than to enumerate the facts of your dilemma. To fear danger is helpless unless you find ways to protect against it. To dread contagions requires you to conquer the germs. You cannot avoid loss from the carelessness of others unless you learn to control your relation to them. When people won't let you alone, it's because you haven't learned how to make them do it. Injustice preys upon you until you give your thought to its conquest. Suffering is for the purpose of arousing you, teaching you, forcing you to use your wits on the problems in your life. Where you put your attention and how calmly, persistently and carefully it is directed determines your happiness. Success begins with you. 8. A way that wins. There is no queerer fact in life than the neglect will show toward deficiency. One would think from the way we talk that methods which succeed would interest us. They do, in theory. We like to hear about them. In any case, Parmela Steadman observed for years the easy way in which her sister, Bernice, dominated the home. If money was to be spent on clothes, Bernice was considered first. If singing lessons were in order, Bernice received the training. When a trip to Europe was planned, it was she who went. Ever and always Bernice was center stage. Nor was her father the only adoring worshipper of the older daughter's charms. Her mother, too, spent hours shopping with her, then weeks upon her clothing, sewing this, knitting that. In secret, Parmela had wondered about this favoritism. And the strange part of it was, everyone took it as matter of course. Finally Parmela had an inspiration. It came from reading a popular novel in which the heroine of the story was placed in the same situation in which the young woman found herself. The author most graciously explained not only why Parmela played so poor a second part, but gave a vivid analysis of the older sister's methods. She alternated between tantrums and flattery. The dominating vixen in the narrative paid her parents for their kindness by cooing and petting them for all they did. The shopping parties were made intriguing to the mother, the giving of presents brought a sense of power to the family provider. He was never allowed to forget how great and wonderful he was. This adroit devotion she punctuated by fits of temporary and diplomacy yielded no dividends. How like international affairs, the author remarked constant secret scheming and an entente cordiale, then the threat of war, if the maneuvering failed. There was always something to adjust, something to have to decide, a strategy of affection, a hint of hate cleverly at work. Light broke rapidly for Parmela after that. She watched her sister's skill. But what could a girl with her feelings do about it? She couldn't work her father. 
she loved him. She couldn't flatter her mother. It seemed insulting, as if there were no depth of feeling in their relation to one another. Yet the clever, superficial manner succeeded where hers had failed. She knew Bernice felt little devotion compared to her own. Parmela thought patiently about her problem. There was a principle involved if she could only find it. When it came to her, she laughed at the blindness that had made it so hard. She must repay her parents. Why, of course. Not even those who loved were satisfied unless there was some reward. We are all selfish at heart. She must dedicate herself to some cause in which they would have faith, give them something to adjust to as striking and inevitable as Bernice's tantrums. The two needs came together when she saw how she longed to enter her father's business, longed to carry some of his burdens. I'll become his right hand man, she told herself. All the family treat him with consideration, is he not the great provider? Later, as she looked back, she smiled at the ease with which her battle had been won. It was Parmela this, and Parmela that. She was to take a business trip, having proved that as a woman buyer she was especially valuable to the firm. Mother did this, father did that. She must not become too tired. She must dress better than anyone, the business required it. Parmela found it easy to give a grateful affection in return for her new joy, a warmth under which her parents blossomed. She had discovered at least one key to conquest. When Parmela married, it brought new problems. As the years passed, her husband became critical. He turned his fault finding on her handling of the children. Nothing she did seemed to satisfy. Her unhappiness over the situation lasted until she decided there must be some conquering conduct not less efficient in this new dilemma than the means she had used to win her way through her family quandary. Was she really so inefficient? She wondered. To discover the facts, Parmela imported into her marriage difficulty the orderly methods that business life had taught her. In her journal she kept a record of the day reporting the situations and remarks of her husband when his blame of her fled up. Then quite as if by accident, and in a gentle manner, she withdrew from each responsibility he had found her incapable of handling. You take care of the matter, she told him. I'm certainly no good in dealing with it. When Conrad did no better, and often worse than she had done, she put her report on the proper page close to the outline of the difficulty. The time soon came when he exploded. He could not be bothered with all these nignags, he told her. They weren't in his line. I think you're right, Con. They aren't in your line. Then why don't you leave them to me? I do when you let me, he contended. Do you, dear? Will you read this little journal? It's dated and right up to the minute. And it won't take you long. It didn't. It took an even shorter time for Conrad to see just what had happened, to face unavoidably his own nagging. I had to make you see it, Con, Parmel explained, softly. People fail because they don't know how to protect the truth. Con didn't answer. He merely put his arms around her and held her tight. In every life there are turning points, little acts that mark one's stride towards success or a downward step in failure. We are constantly making these moves. Joy or pain follows inevitably. Parmela, believing she should never compromise herself, had dared to act with vigor in a situation that might otherwise have become overpowering. She freed herself from that half-measure which so many women endure in marriage, 